so much, thank you. And coming up in this week's show... James stands next to a car. Richard pulls a face. And some Toblerone falls over. It is, um, it is an action-packed show, but we start with Lancia. I've said many times that over the last hundred years, no one has made more truly exciting cars. There was the Integrale and the Stratos and the Fulvia and the O37. The list goes on and on, and yet all they make today is a steaming pile of odour called the Ypsilon. Look at it. <laughs> I would rather have a maggot-infested wound than drive one of those. <laughs> Honestly, it makes me sad that they've been reduced to making that, and it turns out I'm not the only one. There's a man in Italy called Eugenio Amos who looked at the old Delta Integrale and found himself wondering... What would it be like if Lancia made it today? How would it feel? How would it go? And then he stopped wondering and decided to find out. This is what he came up with. The engine is a 16 valve, 2 litre turbo, as it was before, but it has new rods, new pistons, a new turbocharger, and a lot of electronic tweaking. So now it develops 330 horsepower. Go. But precisely because it isn't an Audi. And I love it because someone cared enough to make it. And I love it most of all because it's giving me my youth back. It is a bloody brilliant car, this. Get on with it. panels and suspension components are now made from either aluminium or carbon fiber and there are two advantages to that number one they won't rust and number two they're light and because of all this work this car is pretty quick there's a fair bit of period turbo lag as you can hear But when it gets on song... Bloody hell! No. That's not do. Quite scary through here. Come on! Come on! Oh no! Hurry up! Oh, 
Now we go on to the really fast bit. Oh, good. It's tricky. in four seconds and flat out it'll be doing more than 160 miles an hour the best thing though is that all the understeer you got in the original car has been replaced with an extraordinary amount of grip and neutrality you have got to love the Italians haven't you I mean Giulio <laughs> said a lot of the stuff in here wasn't working because if it was working, then it would be an Audi. <laughs> there is, however, one problem. It costs a quarter of a million pounds. <laughs> Integrale, here we go. Didn't bother filming it, but we haven't got the time. Uh oh. <laughs> Now, well, old... no, look at it this way. It's actually the same speed as a BMW M2. I think I can also claim quite reasonably that the old Mercedes A45 would go around the track faster than that. Yeah, and be a hell of a lot cheaper. Yes, but, fact. but what, what? everything on a Mercedes would work. And who wants that? Be dull. <laughs> it's, what you, it's what Eugenio was saying. You don't want German stuff. You aren't in the Italian frame of mind, you oh, two. we're not. No, you're not. That's okay. the trouble. Has well, anyone here got oh, an Italian God. car? No, they're not here, are they? They didn't make it. <laughs> it's raining. Did you... Yes, that is a good point, actually. It's also very windy, and before the tent blows away, we should get on. We should. Yeah. We must move on. Yeah, let's move it on. Now, earlier on, Jeremy was listing all the wonderful and remarkable cars that Lancia have made over the years. But let's not forget, Porsche has also made some rather remarkable cars. Absolutely. There was the 911. There was another sort of 911. <laughs> there was a slightly different 911 that was green. Yes, 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 I know. But this year marks the 50th anniversary of what I think must be the greatest Porsche of them all. Is it a 911? <laughs> no. It's called the Porsche 917. And even if you have no interest in motorsport, you'll most likely recognise this machine because it's quite possibly the most iconic racing car ever created. The first thing you need to know is that although the 917 looks like a big, wide car, actually, it isn't. Ow. I'm in. 
God, it's tiny. Porsche is the most successful car maker ever to race at Le Mans. They have 19 victories to their name. But this is the car that started it all. This is the car that gave them that all-important first win. The following year at Le Mans, on the way to another crushing victory, it would go through the speed traps at over 241 miles an hour, a record that stood for more than 20 years. And in that same race, it was so fast it would cover a total of 3,315 miles, a distance record that would stand until 2010. Ow! I have been clever. Right then, let's go. It's a 50-year-old car. The 917 is fast by the standards of any decade. 0 to 60, 2.7 seconds. Top speed, 224 miles an hour. Away! Go faster. How rubbish! There we go. This is just... 
just brilliant. Shouldn't feel so good, but it does. Hey. Ow. And it was built without compromise using the absolute bare minimum of materials. So, for example, this bodywork, which is very close to my head, it's fiberglass, 1.2 millimeters thick. That's it. Now, in front of me, I have a big rev counter, an oil temperature gauge, and an oil pressure gauge. That's all the information you get. If those are reading correctly, that means the engine isn't going to blow up, and that means you can pin it. Here we go. This is a piece of cake. Good! Concentrate, look through the bend. This is quite a complicated one. Ah! Well, that's interesting. Ooh. I'm winning. The 12 cylinder engine produces 621 horsepower, which is modest by the standards of today's road going hypercars. But this thing weighs just 800 kilograms. As a result, the power to weight is off the scale. Bloody hell, this is special. What's more amazing than that, actually, is that this car exists at all because its gestation was. Let's say it was quite difficult. The story of its birth starts in 1968, when the governing body for sports car racing, alarmed that the top-end unregulated prototype cars were becoming too fast, too expensive and too dangerous, decreed that such machines should have engines no larger than three litres. However, the governing body also said that if you could build 25 road-going versions of your racing car, that engine limit would be raised to 5 litres. Although, secretly, they knew that no small sports car manufacturer could actually afford to do that. They didn't think there'd be any takers. The ragtag Porsche team just made the deadline, and the motorsport inspectors gave the road cars the sign-off presumably not inspected them too closely, or they would have noticed that most of them had truck axles. Pierre hoped for a big win at the 1969 Le Mans race, but it was a disaster. One of the privately entered cars crashed on lap one, killing its driver. The others broke down as the race wore on, until just one remained driven by this man, British driver Dickie Atwood. Difficult would be uh, putting it mildly. Um, uh, Life-threatening could be another one. Um, right. It was um, a monster. It was made for speed, like a bullet to go through the air, but the, uh, there wasn't enough pressure on the bodywork to keep it on the ground. 
And now, since the legend is celebrating its 50th birthday, I think it deserves a fun day out. So I thought, why don't we put Mr Dickie Atwood back in it to stretch its legs a bit and spice things up? And whilst he's there, let's see how the old legend, I mean the car, stacks up against a modern Porsche. Specifically this Porsche, the 911 GT2 RS. The biggest gun in Porsche's current arsenal. Now, attentive viewers will have noticed that I'm not actually driving, and that's because I've decided to do this properly. We're going to have old Porsche Le Mans winning racing driver versus young Porsche Le Mans winning racing driver, because this is Neil Yanni, and he won for Porsche in 2016 in the 919. To be honest, he's also probably a bit better at this than I am. Away! This is a piece of cake. So you see, James, some old men can drive fast. <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, let's move it on, shall we? Yep, let's move it on. Um, as you would probably imagine, we have to travel a lot to make this show. I mean, just in making this series alone, we have been to Colombia, Detroit, Las Vegas, Scotland, Tbilisi, Baku, Istanbul, Helsinki and Chongqing. Mongolia, Hong Kong, Florida, Spain, France, Italy. Switzerland. But that's just... Yeah, and we're not making that up. We genuinely have been that far. Yes. And that means we have to go through a lot of airports, and almost all of them. Drivers are mad for a number of small reasons, and one big one. Yeah, you. What? <laughs> well, you. We have to travel with you everywhere, and you never stop ranting about it. Well, I do a little bit of that, yeah. A little bit? Yeah. The first 20 minutes of the film we're about to see are just rants before we even get to the point. Yeah, that is true, but it's worth it, as you shall see. This is London Stansted Airport, which is located nowhere near London. I came here on a train, 2,000 people on it, no security at all. Going on an aeroplane, ooh, well, I'll do this.
And then, of course, is your bag going to be selected for a special search? Of course it is. All, yes, there you go. You've been through an X-ray machine. If you go to a hospital and you X-ray somebody's leg, OK, you say, right, it's not broken, I can see that, but let's just cut your flesh open to make sure. It's, it's, no, it's been X-rayed. Why are they looking at it again? Oh, here we go. Yep, salt, self-raising flour, normal flour, baking powder, talcum powder. That's from an athlete's foot. I put them in clear bags every single airport you go through anywhere in the world. Why are they so interested in my condiments and medical necessities? I don't I mean, know, mate. And then you're out of security and straight into a shop, which wouldn't be so bad if it sold something you actually wanted, like bog roll or cat food. But no, all they sell is perfume. Why do they think when you get to an airport, all oh, right, I've suddenly overcome with a need to smell like Victoria Beckham. Then you've got the adverts. Look at that half-wit. Look at him. Every advert in every airport makes no sense. I can see now why James May volunteered not to be in this film. And finally, you get to the gate, which is so far from civilization, they're still using a dot matrix printer. We have explained to him that the walk has to be this long because aeroplanes are wide because they've got wings, but he can't seem to understand the concept. Look, you will admit that that was a long walk, yes? I don't yeah. care what the reason is, it's a long walk. It is quite a stretch, yes. Which is why we decided to address the problem. Shut him up. So, here we are, arriving at the airport again, with what looks like normal hand luggage. OK, what I have here, as you can see, is a perfectly ordinary wheeled suitcase. If I fold the handle away, it will fit in an overhead locker. However, if I lay it down like so, you can see it's starting to look like a car. Not really, mate. No, it is. It will look even more like a car when I have completed the build and then... You heard that? A solid click, like an M16 rifle bolt. This is my accelerator, my brake, and then I simply I'm sitting on it, being quite careful to keep that away from my plums, and I am ready to go. So, where's yours? Here. Yeah. Where? Laptop. Yeah. Put it on the floor. Wheeled laptop. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but. Oh, I see you standing on it. Yeah. And I'm off. So, where's your luggage? In my pocket. I got. Pants, toothbrush, everything I need. I'm good to go. I mean, that does look a bit dangerous. It is. <laughs> That's why I'm wearing all these pads. Right, are we ready, then, to revolutionise air travel? Yeah, the worst bit of our every working day is about to get better. Let's do this. Another advantage of this, I am tall. I reckon I'm 5'11 on this. Yeah, there's been a bit of a role reversal. It's good. I'm going to be honest with you. In a matter of moments, we arrived at the check-in. Go. Hello, this is the future. I genuinely have hurt my ankle. Hello. Sorry about that. Sorry. Ow. Are you checking in the bag? No. He's on it. I have it here. It's here. He's not normally that tall. Shut up. Into security. Oh, God, my foot. Sorry. Sorry. That Sorry. That was my other foot. Yep, that happened. Thanks. But you never had a steering wheel go through customs before, have you? Ooh. Right, onwards. Yeah. Go.
was there in May. Suitcase, not counting this one. Well, that was that was <laughs> that was a bad mistake. Well, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Soon we were motoring through the duty-free shops. Oh shit! No. Oh, hammer's gone. Ow! I He's meant gone. That.
Nothing to see. Is it gate 88, Hammond? What? No, mate, it's this one. There's the plane! <sighs> and on that terrible disappointment, back to the tent. Right, we know how his works. I, just, I'm... I fell out of a tunnel! Yeah, and I'm not interested in that. I want to know how yours works, is it? Well, it's exactly the same. It was cordless drill motor and some laptop batteries. Right, and you're claiming that has a top speed of 28 miles an hour. I was doing 28 when I fell out of the tunnel. Really? Yes, yeah. 28. I didn't believe him either, so when the airport quietened down a bit, mm. we organised a race. Right, here's Abby on my superb suitcase. Good start. Up, who here would like to have one of those for going through it? Yes, yeah, right. they're on to something. Yeah. So those those things created are a complete menace to using them. Uh, fair? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, that yeah. is fair. Actually, now I've come to think of it. And so on that terrible disappointment, it's time to end. Now, next week there's a Grand Tour special. We're attempting to cross the vast wilderness that is Mongolia using a car that we built, well, they built ourselves. <laughs> See you then. Take care. Good night.